Well, thanks for coming today. Um, I want to start by telling you a little story. Um, about 15 years ago, um, I was in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And as you may have heard, they have somewhat different attitudes about uh, drug use there uh, than we do. And, and uh, I have family over there. And so uh, my family, uh, this, this uh, friend of mine, he, he took me on to this parade where the, the Amsterdam Junkies Union had a bus that went in this parade. And, and I got to ride in the bus and meet all of these folks who freely labeled themselves as, as uh, junkies uh, and weren't particularly upset about being junkies and were demonstrating their new uh, crack pipe, which I didn't try, but uh, you know, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. And what I realized after riding with these folks for an hour or two is um, they were different. They were not quite the same as everybody else. And I couldn't really put my finger on why they were different or how they were different. Uh, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm an experimental psychologist. And I wasn't going to be doing any experiments on these folks. But uh, I thought it was kind of interesting. And what I want to talk to you today about today is how we can use animal models to try to understand um, what it is that's different in folks who might have a predilection towards uh, drug abuse. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, alcoholism, what it is. We'll talk about the concept of heritability that Oksana uh, started talking about. Um, we'll talk about some of the work that I do in selective breeding uh, for uh, alcohol consumption. And then we'll uh, spend the rest of the talk on this construct of, of impulsivity and get into how we uh, measure that. So alcoholism, as you guys probably know, is, is defined by encountering problems in drinking too much alcohol. And we don't define it by the amount of alcohol that you drink, but we define it by the fact that you drink when it's creating problems for you. So what do I mean by that? You know, blackouts, uh, drinking and driving. And over the long term, alcoholism creates health problems for folks who drink cirrhosis, uh, heart disease, uh, and dependence and withdrawal. So people get, can get to a point where they have to drink in order to function. And um, alcoholism is one of the predominant causes of preventable death in our country. So tobacco smoking outweighs all the rest of them, but uh, alcohol consumption is, is certainly a significant cause of preventable death. And, and as, as it is, most alcohol drinkers also smoke uh, tobacco. One of the interesting things, I think, about alcoholism is the fact that unlike let's say, uh, cocaine use, most of us at some point or another are going to try alcohol. And so the question is, well, does that put you at risk for alcoholism? Well, to some extent it does, because if you grow up a Muslim or a Mormon and you are completely abstemious your entire life, you, you can't become an alcoholic. For most of the 90% or so of people who try alcohol, 80 to 90%, something like 20%, 15 to 20% are going to, at some point in their life, have a problem drinking. And usually it's to some degree age defined. So you see that problem drinking tends to decline over the lifespan. But this is at least in part because folks who drink too much can die early. And it's in part because people get well uh, and stop drinking. And you can also see it's, it's, alcoholism is more prevalent in men than in women. So alcoholism runs in families. And, and this is perhaps not surprising. Uh, we probably, uh, all of us to some degree, might know of families who have problems with alcohol. But what's perhaps more interesting is that you've, we find that even if we take the child of someone who was an alcoholic and adopt them into a family where there are no alcoholics, there's still a triple the risk for alcoholism compared to somebody who doesn't have a biological parent that drinks too much. Um, and they have about quadruple the risk if they grew up in a family, uh, especially if they're uh, a man, uh, who was raised by an alcoholic uh, parent. So what we can see from that is that, that alcoholism is to some extent both heritable, it runs in families, and environmental, that if you're raised in an alcoholic family, that you're even more likely to become an alcoholic uh, than if you were just adopted away from it. So what does it mean for something to be heritable? This is the idea 
that to some degree something is caused by genetics and it runs in families. Certainly we all know that our, we, we look more like our family members than the general population. We can often tell uh, who's in our family and who's not just by their face. That's because appearance is heritable. And behavior also can be heritable. Sometimes it's even more heritable than things like body weight that we accept readily as being something that might run in families. And if something is heritable, then certainly we can predict the risk, just like I've told you, for a condition like alcoholism based on knowing how the parents are. Um, and we can also focus on both genetics and environment when trying to understand uh, how to fix something like alcoholism, how to cure this disease. So in my lab, we use animal studies to, to study heritability directly. So one of the nice things about working with animals is you can actually change factors that are heritable. Uh, we can actually go in and change behaviors and change genes by breeding animals to have certain traits. So selective breeding is you know, the oldest genetic modification technique. It's been around since the Greeks. This is where we get all of our agricultural stuffs, right? We breed plants and animals for certain traits. And obviously we domesticated at some point in our history the dog, so we took them from uh, you know, the wolf that can be aggressive to uh, your friendly golden retriever here that's uh, ready to play. And so that tells us that these behavioral traits, these personality traits in animals can be modified by genetics and can be changed uh, on, in a purposeful way. So in my lab, we selectively breed animals for differences in alcohol consumption. So we actually have these uh, different lines of mice. We have high preferring mice that like to drink alcohol when it's available, and low preferring mice that really won't touch the stuff. Um, and the way we breed them is that we give all of our mice a choice. Over a one month period, they get to drink either, uh, they have access to just a water tube or a tube that contains unflavored but 10% alcohol. The ones that choose to drink the alcohol, we breed them and they become the high alcohol preferring line. And the ones that choose not to drink alcohol, we breed them and they become the low preferring line. Mice always have a choice to drink alcohol or water. So we're not forcing these animals to become intoxicated. Really what we're interested in is why would one mouse choose to drink and another mouse choose not to? So what this graph shows is how the drinking behavior changes over generations of selective breeding. So when you start uh, with a population, we started with one just like Oksana talked about, a very outbred uh, population with many different genes. And like most rodents, these guys really don't like alcohol. Rodents aren't particularly uh, favorable towards alcohol. And they don't drink much of it. And very quickly, if you breed them not to drink it, they they completely stop drinking. So these animals will drink no alcohol at all when given the choice. But over many generations, this is each one of these numbers here represents a generation of selective breeding. We get about three or four a year. So you can see this takes a while. Um, the ones that we breed to drink alcohol, they drink more and more and more over time. Okay, so we, we, we test a population we, and we take the highest drinkers, and then their offspring, we test them again, take the highest drinkers, and so on. So it's an iterative process, all right? And what we're doing then is changing the genes that underlie this behavior in a way that's defined in my lab by this preference for alcohol, okay? So these, we don't know what genes are being changed, but we do know that they're relevant to this behavior of free choice alcohol consumption. So these mice actually drink a lot of alcohol. So to orient you on this graph, these are some of the different lines that we've bred for high drinking in my lab. This is a, a commonly used uh, mouse strain that's used in drinking experiments. And this line over here represents how intoxicated the animals get. So if we just let them drink to their heart's content, um, if you get pulled over for DWI, you would be at uh, 80 milligrams percent or higher, right? That's the legal limit for driving. So that's just under 100 here. And you can see that these guys are getting up to well over 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now for most of us here, or at least I'm guessing, 
Uh, if you were at that level of intoxication, you would probably be passed out on the floor. Um, this is a very high level of alcohol consumption, although interestingly, it is very similar to the amount of alcohol intoxication that you get in folks who are alcoholics. So we all know that alcoholics can, to some degree, hold their liquor, as we say, they're tolerant, and these mice are too. Uh, in fact, when I worked with these animals, I was very surprised by these data because these animals don't look drunk at all. So after many weeks of drinking, they can hold their liquor and they can get to these very high blood alcohol levels. And perhaps more crucially, they do this on their own volition. I'm not forcing them to. They, this is what they choose to do. This is what they're selectively bred to do. So I won't take too much time here, but what's kind of interesting is that when these mice have been drinking for a long time, they will drink the alcohol even when it's mixed with a flavor that I previously paired with gastrointestinal illness. So as most of you probably know, if you go out and, well, maybe you don't, you're your high school students, but if you go out and drink too much, uh, the next day if you smell or taste what you drank, you're just like, oh God, take that away. Um, and this is a, a, a behavior called taste aversion. And so we take that flavor and we mix it in with the alcohol. And the question is, will they drink the alcohol even when it's mixed with a flavor that they think might make them ill? And if these are high preferring mice and if they've been drinking for a long time, the answer is yes. So they will drink to overcome uh, even in you know, a really bad taste, okay? And this is a little bit closer. So, so when we look at the blood alcohol levels, you know, alcoholism isn't defined by how much you drink, um, but it is defined uh, by drinking even in the presence of signals that say you really shouldn't be drinking right now. And, and I would argue that these guys have been drinking a long time. They, they uh, will start drinking the alcohol even when they probably shouldn't. It's a fair question to ask, well, what the heck can you learn about humans uh, by studying mice? So to go back to the Amsterdam Junkies Union, how could I possibly use these mice to understand what was different about these folks who had been using drugs all their lives? And one immediate question that comes up is, were these folks in Amsterdam different because they'd been using crack for many years and you know that changed them in some way, or heroin or whatever? Or were they different to start with? And, and exactly in what way and exactly what differences might have caused them to choose that lifestyle, okay? So um, is, for alcoholics, is, is their response to alcohol different? Um, is it their behavior when they're sober? Is it something else? How do we figure it out? So um, one way we can start to approach this is to ask how high alcohol preferring mice are different than low alcohol preferring mice, right? And um, I'm gonna talk to you today about a construct called uh, impulsivity. So impulsivity is really a general idea that means not carefully considering the future when making decisions. So this term is kind of new, but the idea has been around and is at the heart of many folk tales that we have in our society. So, um, you know, I, I think you think about it in at least two cultural memes, sort of the fool in folk tales, you know, the guy who sells his cow for the magic beans, right? Uh, or, you know, this, this concept of virtue and vice. So, if you think about virtue and vice, um, what does it mean to have vice? It means doing that which feels good right now and not really worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Whereas generally being virtuous means, you know, maybe uh, encountering difficulties now in the hope that in the future you can, you're working towards something, right? Um, whether it be the afterlife or just 10 years from now, it doesn't really matter, right? So the grasshopper, you see him here. He's, he's, uh, he's got his fiddle here, it's hard to see, and he's just hanging out and sipping a drink. And this ant is working his butt off, and it's hot, and he's dragging this corn around. And, you know, the grasshopper's like, hey, you know, have a good time, you know. And then winter rolls around, and here's the ant who's steadfastly sweeping out his little apartment. And the grasshopper comes, and he's freezing, and he's hungry. And, and, you know, can I have some of your food, please? So this is this idea that, you know, 
doing what feels good right now may not be the best long-term strategy, right? You have to think about the future. You have to think about the fact that winter is coming and you need to get ready, right? So again, this is, this is consistent with what we're going to talk about in this idea of impulsivity. So I, I, I wonder if someone will um, play the delay discounting game with me right now. Can I, can I get a volunteer? I'm just going to ask you some question. Yeah, all right. So I reach into my wallet here. We're just going to pretend, but let's, I got 20 bucks here, right? <laughs> 20 bucks. So would you like these $20 right now? Or are you willing to wait a year for $100? What do you say? I'll wait a year for $100. You're waiting a year for $100. Smart man. All right. Um, I got 40 bucks right now. <laughs> you, will you take the 40 bucks right now, or are you going to wait a year for $100? I'll wait a year for $100. Wow, okay, all right. I'm starting to run out of money. Let's see. Uh, I, got, I got 60 bucks right now. Will you take it, or are you going to wait a year for $100? I'll take it. You'll take it. All right, all right. So what did we just find out about? Uh, what we found out is that, you know, 100 bucks is great. Everybody, like, if you're given the choice, do I want 100 bucks right now or 100 bucks in a year? Duh, right? But it gets a little more complicated than that when you're faced with something right now. Right now is really, really alluring, right? And things that are given to you right now are generally better than things in the future, even if they're the same. And we see that waiting for something makes it less valuable. So for this young man here, waiting a year for $100 decayed its value or discounted its value by about 40 bucks. So 60 bucks right now and 100 bucks in a year are subjectively kind of similar, all right, which is not at all unreasonable. And all Mammals, as far as I know, all that have been tested do this. We, we value what is right now. Why do you think that is? Instant gratification. So that's why it is at a psychological level. We like instant gratification. Why do you think it exists, though? Why did it evolve? So if you have an abundance, grab what you can now. And there could be uncertainty, right? Even if you take something, how do you know you're still going to have it in a year? So generally speaking, it's more certain and better to have things now than in the future. But on the other hand, how much are you willing to give up in the future by working for now? So if we think about this, this grasshopper, he's having a great time right now, and this ant isn't, okay? But in the future, their roles are switched, all right? And so thinking about the future is important as well as thinking about now. And it's normal to balance these things and to think about them that way. So can we measure uh, these concepts in mice? Okay, And if so, why would that be important? So we can actually measure whether mice think about the future with a task very much like I played with the money, except, of course, mice don't really care about money. So we give them a, a, a chance to drink a saccharin solution. Um, so we can actually find out whether mice are impulsive, and we can ask whether the high-preferring and the low-preferring mice might differ in the level to which they're impulsive. So basically, we give them a choice of a little bit of sweet water right now, or a lot more if you're willing to wait, just like the thing with money, right? So um, this is what the apparatus looks like. It's hard to see, but this is just a box that you can put the mouse in. And here is a little sipper tube that has sweet water that we can either retract so the mouse can't drink it or deliver to the mouse so that they can. And uh, we run this procedure where the mouse nose pokes here to say they're ready. And then these two lights come on. One is over a lever that's paired with a delayed reward. That's like the $100 in a year, although only in this case it's two seconds of sipper access. Okay, they get to drink from this spot for two seconds. The immediate lever is signaled by this light and a lever. And if they press, if they make that choice, they get the re reward right away. Okay, like the 60 bucks right now. Okay, and we start off with one second of sipper access for the immediate reward. And then what we do is if they choose the immediate reward, we make it smaller. And if they choose 
the delayed reward, we make the immediate reward larger. So just like this young man, we kept making the immediate reward larger. And if we got to 60 bucks, then I might start coming down to 50 and start haggling. Well, exactly how much are you willing to discount the value of the reward as a result of waiting? And the mice will do the same thing, only instead of waiting a year, because I would get old and they would be dead, um, we, we wait four to six or eight seconds, okay? So we're asking you this over very short amounts of time. And we sort of haggle with them. And over different sessions, we make them wait longer and longer to the delayed reward. So when delivered immediately, two seconds of zipper access time is worth two seconds. And when it's delayed by eight seconds here, you see that it's delay decaying the subjective value of that reward by 75%. So here, a, a year decayed the value of the subjective reward by 40%. In a mouse, eight seconds will decay it by three quarters. Okay? So mice are relatively impulsive. And I guess that's normal for a mouse. But the more interesting thing is that what we find is that the, if you look at this curve, this is the value of the reward as a function of the delay to its presentation. So the longer you have to wait for that zipper, the less it's worth, right? So an eight second delay decays its value by somewhere between 75 and 85%. But it turns out if you're genetically likely to drink, so these mice have never consumed alcohol, but it, if you're bred to drink alcohol, you decay the value of that immediate reward, or sorry, the delayed reward more quickly if, if you have the genes to drink. So another way of saying that is if you are genetically predisposed to drink and you're a mouse, you're more impulsive than a mouse who's not so predisposed. Turns out the same thing is true in humans. And the, and the, 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 the appearance of these graphs are remarkably similar. So these are studies where people are offered money after different delays. So, and they're much longer than the one I asked this young man about. So this is 50 months, right, for, for over four years. Here's uh, 300 months. And you see that in people who are not drug addicted, there is a normal decline in the value of money as a function of it, the delay. But if you're a drug addict, that decline is much steeper, okay? So the value of money is discounted very rapidly if you're a drug addict. Interestingly, um, the value of heroin is discounted even more steeply. These were, were heroin addicts. And it's not just for illicit drugs. So here are smokers, okay? Here are controls, here are smokers. And smokers also discount the value of rewards more quickly. And from the mouse studies, we can say, well, these guys have never drunk alcohol, so it's something that's in their genes that is predisposing them where if I gave them the chance to drink, they would drink more. Um, now, why is it that impulsivity or not thinking so much about the future is correlated with drug use? And one of the hallmarks of drugs, I think it's true for all drugs, um, is that they feel good right now. Drugs feel great the moment you take them and very soon thereafter. Wait a couple hours or a day and not so good anymore. I mean, especially if it's alcohol, right? And you get a hangover, so you feel great immediately, and the next day you feel horrible, right? So this is a study from Andrea King's lab. She's here at, on the faculty at the University of Chicago. And she actually asked people how much they liked the way they were feeling. And half an hour after drinking, uh, heavy drinkers really like the way that they're feeling. Light drinkers don't really change that much. Uh, but two hours later, light drinkers feel pretty crappy. They feel worse than they did at the start. Uh, and heavy drinkers feel just a little bit worse. But the bottom line here is that soon after drinking, we feel good. Long after drinking, we feel worse than normal. And so if you think about it, if you're impulsive and you think about what feels good now, then you're going to have problems with drugs because drugs as a class feel good now and less good uh, later. So uh, I want to quickly walk you through some studies we've done trying to ask whether if we fix this impulse control, can we decrease the amount of alcohol that these mice choose to drink? So remember, these mice normally drink a lot of alcohol. And we can use them 
as an animal model to potentially develop medications that might help human alcoholics. Okay? And in this study, we tested a couple of different antidepressants. One was called amitiphidine, another was called Dove 102 uh, 677. And these are drugs that act as serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine reuptake blockers. Okay? So they increase the amount of these neurotransmitters in the synapse. So amitiphidine, this is again an antidepressant, and it has this sort of funky effect on delayed discounting. So the higher the number here, the less impulsive these mice are. This is a somewhat different way of looking at the data. And at one of these doses, eight milligrams per kilogram, you see that it decreases how impulsive these high-preferring mice are. This other drug, Dove 102677, shows that the more drug you give, the less impulsive animals are. So then the question is, okay, if this drug, if these drugs decrease how impulsive the animals are, how willing they are to think about the future, does it also decrease the amount of alcohol that they consume? And the answer is yes, that uh, both, both of these drugs will decrease the amount of alcohol that the mice consume. Uh, and, and for, you know, this is over the dark part of the cycle. Mice are, they only drink in the dark, they're nocturnal. And the high dose will decrease alcohol consumption by about, uh, for about a six hour period. So while the animals are feeling the effects of these drugs, they're less impulsive and they drink less alcohol, which again tends to tie this construct of impulsivity to alcohol drinking. And this drug, um, Dove 102677, it's actually a pretty effective dopamine uptake blocker. And it's more effective both for um, the impulsivity and decreasing drinking. So what these data suggest is that if we can, if we can think about the causal factors for drug addiction, things like impulsivity, I'm not saying that's the only cause, it's a cause, and we can think about ways to change those causes, then we can potentially find new medications for this kind of condition. So I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about this relationship between impulsivity and alcoholism. You know, alcoholism is not evenly spread across the population, and sometimes people with other psychological problems also have a problem with alcohol. This is a, a phenomenon that we call comorbidity. So it's when you have two diseases at the same time. Now the question has always been, does alcoholism cause psychological problems or do psychological problems cause alcoholism? And if we look at these data, so this is, uh, these are a number of different psychological conditions, bipolar disorder, which is what sometimes called manic depression, um, dysthymia, which is chronic um, depression, antisocial, personality disorder, which um, is, is a, a, a phenomenon where people uh, don't follow the rules and they can just sort of use other folks instead of um, having normal relationships. Many of these conditions show changes in delay discounting. Interestingly, they show steeper delay discounting. And this, what this chart shows is how much more likely are you to be an alcoholic if you have this condition? So if you have antisocial personality disorder, you're three times as likely to become an alcoholic as someone who does not have antisocial personality disorder. And what I would submit to you is that for some of the people who are alcoholics, if they have these comorbid conditions, these conditions, even though they're very genetically diverse, so there's, there's probably no link between bipolar disorder and dependent personality disorder, but what they all do is cause impulsivity. And that may be the gateway to making drugs more attractive than they otherwise would be. So I think one way to think about this is that addiction is potentially then a symptom, a symptom of an underlying problem making decisions, an underlying problem of being able to sufficiently value the future. And it's not necessarily a cause of that, although it might be, we didn't examine that today. But if you are, uh, if you have any of these personality disorders or, or mental conditions, it's really risky to start drinking because it's going to be very hard then to control your behavior. And I think if we think about uh, drug addiction through the prism of, of impulsivity, we may be able to come up with new drugs 
we may be able to come up with better uh, treatments the, uh, from the behavioral standpoint and education. And one more thing I'll leave with you. When people are very poor, they often behave impulsively, but they're under a lot of stress. So if you can imagine being living on the street or trying to figure out where you're getting your next meal or how you're putting a roof over your head, we know even normal people when living this kind of a lifestyle or under a lot of stress have a hard time thinking about the future. And one way to think about that is you're so concerned with right now and just solving the problems of right now that you can't get out of that hole and you can't plan for the future. And we know that, interestingly, low socioeconomic status predicts both very steep delay discounting, so an inability to value the future, as well as an increase in likelihood to develop drug abuse. So not just psychological conditions, but also socioeconomic conditions that promote impulsivity also promote uh, drug abuse. And I think if I would say one thing to you is think about your long-term future when you're making decisions, and I think you, you will end out coming on top. So I'll take uh, any questions that you guys might have. Thank you. So I was just curious, how does impulsivity and things like um, what you are doing currently, how does that relate to like a job? Is a week a perfect amount of time for an impulse before someone gets paid, or is it, should it be shorter in your opinion? So I think, it, 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 you know, I'm not an industrial organizational psychologist. Those are the folks who study that stuff. But um, most of us who get a job realize that we only get paid once every two weeks or once a month. And we get to the point where we understand that. And we can, I think most people are less impulsive with money than other things, because we're all trained that money sometimes only comes after a delay. Um, whether it should be that, that or not, I don't know. But that's sort of the idea. One more. All right, you were mentioning the Amsterdam Junkies Union and yeah. their use of crack, heroin, and other stuff. Along with the studies that you mentioned, you said illicit drugs. So the, um, your results, does that apply to like recreational drug users as well? So I think what I would say is that initiation of drug use, sort of recreational drug use, has more to do with other things like novelty seeking or who your friends are. But once you start interacting with drugs, thing like, things like impulsivity come more to play. Because then it's like you start realizing how good you're going to feel now and weighing it against how bad you're going to feel later. And those things then are more important. Does that make sense? Oh, you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown.